Hey everyone, this is Kara Crossway Brindle. I have another amazing colleague with me today to talk about something that I have lots of questions on, and I'm sure all of you do too. I will let her introduce herself and explain what our topic is. Julie? Hi, um, thank you, Kara. My name is Julie Richenberger, and I'm a licensed professional counselor, and I specialize in ADHD, trauma, and suicide risk. And today, Kara reached out. She had some questions for me about how to work with clients who have ADHD. And so I'm here to answer some of her questions. Yes, and hopefully the questions of the community, because I know I'm not alone in, in the questions that I have. So I know that this conversation came up because you and I were talking about the prevalence of ADHD. And we're actually seeing a group of people get diagnosed later in their adult lives versus when they're kids. So my first question for you is, how does it differ for a diagnosis of ADHD in childhood versus adulthood? Well, I think it... I think it looks different in that we stereotypically think of ADHD as that hyperactive kid in class who can't sit still. And while that is the case for many people who have ADHD, it is not the case for everyone who has ADHD. Right. And so part of this is just our, our lack of understanding of what ADHD looks like. And people who are often diagnosed later in life tend to have more of the inattentive type, which also happens to be more women Ooh. than men. So um, I guess diagnosing in early childhood usually includes uh, psychological testing done with a psychologist, um, sometimes through the school or privately. And um, they just do a battery of tests that look for executive functionings and um, like what the executive functioning um, challenges are for each right. person. Um, if there's any other learning differences, dyslexia, dysgraphia, um, anything else going on. And um, once they have the diagnosis, then recommendations are given to um, the family and hopefully um, accommodations are then made. In adulthood, um, people oftentimes just kind of self-diagnose. Um, they they mm -hmm. oftentimes just come in and they say, hey, I think I have this. Or they've, someone has brought it to their attention that have you ever, you know, been diagnosed with ADHD or do you have this? And um, the process for diagnosing that in adulthood, at least in the way that I work is a little bit is, di is different. I don't, um, I don't refer out for just like psych, psych testing as an mm. adult. I think that it can miss a lot. Um, and I think that people know themselves and right. we can go through all of those checklists of, you know, what is, where are your challenges with executive functioning and executive functioning is, is the frontal lobe of your brain. So it's where you're, um, you know, able to regulate or, or not your emotions. Um, it's how you process information that you take in. It's your ability to um, follow along in conversations or um, make plans, um, organize, um, manage time, shift from one task to another, focus, begin something in something. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> right. So I think executive function is, is a word is a is two words that are used frequently that aren't often understood. And that's like the, the, the big gulp of what ADHD does and how it impacts us. Yeah. And um, I love that you broke it down so people can say, what is that? What, what would I be self-diagnosing if I'm saying I'm not focused? Yeah, for example. Yeah. yeah. So I think, you know, as a therapist, you know, one thing that you can do is um, there's a lot of checklists out there. Um, there's a person I follow on Instagram, actually their, um, handle is lived experience counselor and counselor has two L's mm. and she has created a, a nice little, uh, executive function chart that you can, it's a, it's a pie chart and you can, um, you color in the parts, uh, that most resonate with you as your challenges. And you can do it with different areas of your life because, we sometimes perform well in some areas and not so well in other areas. And it just, it doesn't make sense. And that's one of the things with ADHD is there's so much inconsistency mm. and that's the most consistent thing with ADHD. I think. <laughs> Ironically. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I like to start with um, just helping people to identify um, where their strengths are in that and where their challenges are, how, um, these both impact relationships with their partner, friends, uh, coworkers, at school, learning, in as many environments as we can cover. Right. And really just empower them to look at 
at what they have, where they're, and what they have in, in terms of strengths and then areas of, of struggle and um, just be able to name it. Because I think as children, we, children who experience ADHD or learning differences in, in any capacity struggle um, with executive function, they really, they don't have the language to describe what's going on for them. Mm-hmm. And they also don't really have the awareness that maybe how they see the world isn't how other people see the world with more neurotypical brains, if you will. I mean, all brains are diverse, but we'll, right. for, for this purpose, we're going to say the brain that works with executive, I don't know, what do you want to, what I would want to call it different, the non-ADHD brain. <laughs> we'll right. just call it that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, they, they, they feel different, they notice things are different, but they don't understand what it is and why. And so a lot of their struggles are around, um, you know, people telling them, try harder, stop doing that. If you just put more effort in, um, try this, try, I mean, it's, it's all about like things that they could do differently. Um, and, be more like the person next to them, be more like, you know, the other kid in the class that's sitting still or that's able to pay attention or that is reading their book without, you know, tapping their feet or um, for, you know, the inattentive type, it's it's really just suffering and in, in more silence, like just mm. this, you know, internal struggle with seeing that things are different, but but getting, getting by, um, but in both cases, not having the ability to, describe what's going on for them, but being told that, that they're not right in oh, so many gosh. ways. Mm-hmm. And so that's what you also see then as adults is that, that repercussions of that and how that impact, impacts their self-esteem over, over time. I can only imagine. So I think that segues nicely into a question that I had for you, which is, is there an analogy or metaphor out there that does resonate with folks who have ADHD? Because I think it is, to your point, hard to put into words. So I don't mm-hmm. know if there's like an imagery the one I've heard when they're little is um, one of those glitter jars that you just it swirls around and it's just like rapid fire and there's just a lot of activity going on in this yeah. like tornado cylinder, if that makes yeah. any sense. Yeah. But I don't know if that's even accurate to folks who identify with this diagnosis, adult or child. So I'm curious what you've heard. Yeah. Um, I, gosh, I can't remember who, who said this. I, I, I think it was Thomas Brown, uh, one of my challenges remembering names. Um, so, um, but he described it as, um, you know, you have an orchestra and you have people from all different skill levels coming together, each playing their instrument, um, some beautifully, um, some with, you know, a little bit more challenge, but it's like having an orchestra where all the parts are there, but there's no conductor. And so they're all trying to play and there's no conductor. Another thing that I, I also saw a video one time, which I don't know how to really describe that, but it's, um, it's a, it was a kid sitting in a classroom and um, all the noises were emphasized in this video. So like the clock ticking on the wall was just like really loud. Someone, you know, chewing gum in the back, like it oftentimes, you know, like they're overstimulated by not just um, by, by everything, you know, by sounds Right. by um, things that they're seeing, by uh, textures on their clothes, discomfort in their seat, having to go to the bathroom, being hungry, but not recognizing me. There's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of overstimulation. And so, I don't know, that's, that's a couple of ways, I think. Um, mm-hmm. Another uh, client of mine brought up this uh, recently about their experience with feeling like they've gotten away with something. And they feel like they've always, like they just keep getting away with things. And I think that it's because, um, you know, they are, they are making, people with ADHD are making, making things work for themselves without mm-hmm. even recognizing it. You know, they are learning, learning to navigate the world in a way that works for them, which oftentimes means they're doing things differently than they're told to do them, but they're still right. getting the same results or whatever, but it works for them. And so they get this, they start to feel like I'm getting away with something or like that imposter syndrome. Like I'm, mm. people are going to find out that I've been doing it differently or that I've been lying or that I've been pretending to get along, you know, and, and pretending to understand. And a lot of times it's true. They are pretending to understand something, but they're, they're learning to adjust and adapt to the environment that they have to 
in a way that um, is creative and specific to them. Yeah, and I was going to say the, the positive reframe is adaptability. That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah, and it's like, you're, you're here, you're, you've done it, you know, you, you're meeting, checking all the boxes that the boxes right. want you to be in, right? At least on the outside with, with your, with where you end up, but the process looks different. And um, so I think that that, um, with that comes a lot of shame and guilt mm -hmm. and confusion um, with I'm, I'm lying, I'm, I'm sneaking, I'm doing things differently when really it's just, they're using what they know to provide or produce whatever others are asking for them. Sure. And that kind of makes me think about this particular subset of people I'm noticing who are being diagnosed in adulthood with ADD or ADHD. Um, and the group is graduate students, people who are high performers, workaholics, perfectionists, which of course are my people. And they're coming into grad school and all of a sudden the study strategies they've used up until this point no longer work. And so instead of being curious about that, which I think you and I would encourage them to be, they're mm -hmm. becoming really rigid, like, oh, this has always worked. Why won't this work now? And, and very much like self-deprecating or self-critical about that. Is that something you've seen with the population as well? Yeah. Um, because they're being challenged academically, probably for the first time, honestly. Um, and <laughs> the thing, <laughs> it, that's what it is. And so, you know, what, what worked before, whether it was taking notes or doing this or doing that, whether it was unique to them or just what everyone says, this is what works, whatever it worked for them up until that point, oftentimes that's when they're, they're challenged academically or challenged um, intellectually. Um, and so they have to learn the material in a different way. Um, mm -hmm. So there is a lot of rigidity in that, I think, because one, they start feeling, I mean, it, it, like you said, it, it's worked for them up until that point. Um, but then it also challenges that I'm stupid, I'm lazy, I'm not getting something. And so those old messages, if they had them as a child are coming back up, oftentimes people who don't struggle until um, at least academically until graduate, graduate levels classes, it, they're just a high, they have a higher intelligence, mm -hmm. really. So. Yeah, I definitely see that too, for the people who've come to me and then said, hey, this is what's going on, or they've had a conversation with their advisor, for example, that like starts this emotion <laughs> mm -hmm. outside of like sleep hygiene and the things I help them with around anxiety. Do you think there are overlapping diagnoses or like correlating diagnoses that when someone has an ADD or ADHD diagnosis that we see others more often that are paired up with that? Um, I see dyslexia a lot, mm. um, anxiety and depression, especially with um, people who are not diagnosed or haven't come to the realization that maybe they have ADHD. Um, they're anxious about forgetting things. They're anxious about learning. They're anxious about fitting in, um, not understanding that they, you know, what their differences are and then depression around, you know, not being good enough. And um, so I see anxiety and depression a lot. Um, eating disorders also, um, wow. binge eating. Um, people who have, um, I mean, addictions can be also, um, I see a lot of trauma as mm. well. So people presenting with like just their nervous system, I guess, overall, just like a um, hyperactive nervous system. Right. Yeah. I remember seeing that in a training where it was like a Venn diagram of PTSD and ADHD and it was overlap and it was like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. It made so much yeah. sense that a child, it was for a child specifically in the training, but it was like a child who presents with these symptoms could have either of these or both because of that overlap, which for me was a huge aha moment as a professional, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And, you know, as whether it's trauma or ADHD as a child, you know, the brain starts to like your brain's adapting, you know, it's growing, it's firing, it's doing all the things that I, you know, the words that I don't know right now in my mind, but um, <laughs> all those big words. Um, but yet the brain's shifting. So if they're in an environment with, you know, where there's a lot of chaos going on, or there's some, you know, trauma or divorce, or, you know, parent is anxious or a parent has ADHD, um, those things impact a person's environment. And so, you know, they're going to adjust in a way that they adjust. And, um, if they experience trauma, you know, it can look like ADHD. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to, 
pick them apart. And mm -hmm. so I think, you know, as adults, the most important thing in my mind is to figure out where the deficits that they're experiencing that are unique to them. What does that look like? And can we rule out other things as well? Like, is there, is there medical stuff going on? You know, are there, yeah. is there food sensitivities? Is there allergies? Is there, you know, are there other things going on as well? So that's why I like to try to empower my clients when they come in to really start to dig into what is it, what works well for you, what's going well in life and where are your challenges and what areas and what do those look like? Right. And that really resonates with the work I'm doing around thyroid disease, because that does lead to like brain fog and loss of focus yes. and is very much medical <laughs> and not Absolutely. mental health, but is misdiagnosed a lot as anxiety and depression. So I imagine ADHD would also fall into there somewhere um, for folks who aren't checking that medical piece. Mm -hmm. So it kind of brings me to a question I'd asked you offline that I'm going to bring back here onto the video, which is, I suspect, tell me if this is true, because I don't have this specialty, but I suspect we're going to see an increase in adult diagnoses of ADHD or inattentive type because of pandemic. And what I mean by that is people are trying to recreate the overstimulation they had before they were working from home. And so now they're, they have the TV on, they have music on, they have checking their email, they're checking Facebook, they're multitasking a lot, at least the population I serve. And so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. If you think that's going to happen, that people are going to have more diagnoses just because of this is their functioning right now in this pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, I think there will be more diagnoses just because of like social media in general, just um, all the people out there that are talking about their experience with having ADHD and more people are gonna be like, oh yes, that, that, that resonates with me or that mm -hmm. feels like me. Um, but yes, like it, it's, we are, overstimulated as a society and oftentimes, yeah. Um, you know, anytime there's big shifts and big changes, like, you know, moving from one environment to another, like with the pandemic, have everybody mm -hmm. going home, working from home. That's also oftentimes when um, like change is when um, symptoms start to heighten because before you have a structure um, in place that works for you and then you get home and, you know, you're shifting to work. And like you said, you have all the other things in your face. And whereas right. when you're in a structured environment with an office setting, there's more accountability around like, well, you can't have your phone out all day. Or you can't have the music on all day, or you can't like, you can listen to your headphones or whatever. But so I think it's more about like, like change, um, shifting the environment, um, brings up a lot for people discomfort. And, um, I mean, with the pandemic, anxiety, trauma with that, right. like so many things. depression, isolation, so many things. So workaholism. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's funny so how you can just work just as hard when the whole world shuts down, like you're still working. <laughs> right. Right. And, yeah. At least I was. Um, <laughs> Topic for another video, I'm sure. I'm like, uh -huh. oh yeah, this is how we kept our sanity for us workaholics. So like, I just need to feel momentum. Yeah. So with that in mind the fact that maybe I'm hearing structure is helpful to folks who have this diagnosis or have some of the characteristics. Is there anything you recommend to clients that help them create that structure for themselves? Any tools or tips? Mm -hmm. um, my tools and tips are always going to be reverting back to them. So mm -hmm. what is it that works for you? What do you think knowing you and how you function would be good for you? Just had this conversation with someone on Friday um, where uh, they were talking about moving from nine to five to starting their own business mm -hmm. and how they were worried about the structure. And I was like, I think we just have to create structure for ourselves that works for us. Like I, I don't work well with the structure of nine to five every day. I do have structure though. My calendar is like a Tetris game. I, is that it? Ten. That's how I call it. Yeah. Okay. I, well, I, I, I say Tetris or tetanus and I get the two mixed up. Oh, it's Tetris. Yeah, Tetris. <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to sound, you know, mm. okay. But <laughs> so, but I have, you know, each day of my calendar is, is filled up in a way that, you know, works for me. Like Tuesday, Mondays, I don't see clients. I'm, I'm doing business stuff. And I kind of make that my flexible day. Cause I like being flexible on this day, Tuesday, you know, I've got a workout in the morning and then I've got clients and then I do a different workout in the evening. Don't worry, I'm not a workoutaholic. 
they were like laying down <laughs> on the ground yoga classes. I and then, <laughs> and then, you know, Wednesday, you know, I'm working, I go in later, I go into work at one and I'm finished at eight or nine, you know, so it's, but it's, I've created a structure that works for me. It needs to be a little bit different each day. Yeah. Um, but also have that, that boundary and I've got a, and boundaries are also something that I think is it, time boundaries are important. Um, so yeah, you've got to figure out what works, works for each person and, right. um, it is trial and error. And I know I made that sound probably really simple that I can have my days all be different, but this is something that I have, like, I think just with the nature of my job, having to schedule people that has allowed me to to do that. I'm always checking my calendar. Like I'm obsessively checking my, my calendar, which is a problem, but I'm afraid that I'm going to miss something based on these old stories that I have. That I'm going to miss something or I'm going to not show up. Or I'm going to be late or I'm going to, you know, like, so, um, yeah, it's but if I were to tell, to it, is, it. <laughs> it is, <laughs> yeah. Um, OCD is another thing that that's come over also that comes <laughs> along. I don't have OCD. Um, but um, if I were to suggest that to one person that might resonate really well with them. And for another person, they might say, no, I absolutely, that won't work for me. Some people are more need to work in the evenings. Some people need to work in the day. So it's, it's really just checking in, um, helping them to, to reflect on how they function best. Um, what times of the day they're most alert and what mm -hmm. types of structure would work for them based yeah. on how they work. Cause structure is, it is a, a component of creating some stability. Oh, I love the question about when are you most alert or awake? Cause I've, I've asked that question of clients too, for productivity purposes overall mm -hmm. across the board. And someone might be a night owl versus a morning person. And I think this all connects back to the research on entrepreneurs that, you know, like 46% of them, us, I, I, I self-identify as an entrepreneur, 46% of us have a mental health diagnosis. And it's almost like a chicken and egg question of like, was the mental health there first? Was the entrepreneurship there first? Are there positives like creativity and innovation? Absolutely. And then there are challenges, like how do you create structure when nine to five doesn't work for a lot of us? Mm -hmm. um, so I just, I wanted to bring that full circle and go, yeah, that makes a lot of sense because I don't like nine to five either. <laughs> yeah. But that's also like a lot of entrepreneurs have ADHD because they've used their strengths to say, hey, you know, like they've identified what works for them. They, maybe they don't know they have ADHD, but, and I'm not, not everyone does that's an right. entrepreneur, but, um, but there's something about like, they learn to create that. But then when you're out on your own, you definitely have to figure out, you know, what, what, uh, resources you need accountability. Like, how do you set up accountability? Like the structure I create for myself is I have clients showing up easy accountability right there. Mm -hmm. Um, for working out, I hate working out. I don't like it. And so, but I enjoy how I feel. It's really good for my brain. It really is good for my brain. I notice it when I'm doing it, but I have to, I have to have memberships at gyms where you sign up for classes and you get charged if you don't show up mm -hmm. because I won't show up. So that accountability um, again. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Okay. And another important thing I think is probably one of the foundations of like when you start to get into tips and tricks is really identifying what your what your core values are how you what's important to you how you want to show up in the world why you want to show up that way in the world mm. and attaching everything to that um hmm. having those values in mind like integrity is one of my my values so anytime I do something that's not in line with that value, I'm immediately like, oh, but if I, so that's, that's <laughs> right. a driver for me. Um, and then also I like the concept of having like this relationship with yourselves, like your past self, your current, your now self, and then your future self. And so attaching, you know, getting up when the alarm goes off for whatever you want to do to the value behind that, why you want to do it, why it's right. important to you, how you're going to feel afterwards, like thinking about your future self, how is your future self going to think? And then once you do it, make sure you high five that past self that did that, that got up out of bed or that sent that, wrote that note in your calendar for you, because um, that will create um, a positive loop within yourself. Mm. Like, you know, my, my future self is going to high five my past self. And that past self is going to get really excited when that happens too, which is your current self. Yeah. I love that. So just all sorts of accountability, but also just like this creative structure to say, how do I do the things I want to do? How do I connect it back to values? Make sure it all feels purposeful, not like empty. Mm -hmm. 
I imagine that wouldn't sit well. Okay. So knowing that and the fact that people are diverse, even as we're having this conversation on video, I know that there's probably not one prescribed way to do something for someone who has a diagnosis like this. Are there certain resources you have them check out outside of the, um, the pie chart that you mentioned today that would help them create some awareness and start to explore what works for them? Um, yeah, I think there's, um, so the um, attention deficit, What is it? I wrote it down because I knew I'd forget the name of it. It's ADDA. <laughs> oh gosh, it's more it. acronyms. <laughs> it is. Um, ADDA. Of course, it's on a page where, of course, it's not. It's ADD.org. So it's the Attention Deficit Disorder like um, Association. Mm -hmm. That's what it's called. Um, <laughs> CHAD is another one. C-H-A-D-D. -D. Oh. Um, it's the Children and Adult with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Both of them have support groups and stuff lots of resources. Um, Attitude Magazine is another one. It has a lot of resources. I think that's affiliated with Chad or part of Chad. I'm not, Thanks. don't quote me on that. Um, and there's lots of books out there for women. Um, there's a book, a uh, radical guide for women with ADHD. Um, it is so creepy to me how in line it is with like the approach <laughs> that I thought I was so brilliantly coming up with with people but it's like it's got some really good probing questions and I think it's the questions um, it's a workbook and the questions throughout apply also to men and so I think that across the board it can be used for both there's specific questions for women um, and just about how you know it affects us differently than men um, just the stereotypical messages we receive as women that we're supposed right. to, you know, be a certain way. And, you know, as a gosh, for women who are mothers, like you have to be able to do all of the executive functioning tasks. Like you're expected to, you know, manage tons of things at one time, the baby, the food, the house, the, you know, the job, all of those things. And for someone with, without ADHD, that's hard enough. But for someone right. with ADHD, where each of those things is an overwhelming task for many of them. And especially when there's children involved, um, <laughs> which just creates another distraction. So anyways, it goes into those types of things, those, th those things. So those would be um, some good ones. Um, ADHD 2.0 just came out. Um, there's a lot of, I mean, there's just so many resources out there. And I think with social media, there's a lot of things on, TikTok and Instagram. And I think you got to, you know, it, not everything is, it's people talking about their experiences, which I think are valid. Right. And I think it's a really good way to connect with people and just, just create language for your experience that you also don't know is maybe different. So. Yeah. And just, I mean, even just the normalization or validation of feeling seen, I imagine is really powerful for mm -hmm. folks as they see people talk about that candidly. I think the big question, because obviously this is a very you know, brief introduction to ADHD or the work that we could be doing with clients for the mental health field. Is there, are there certain resources that you would recommend for folks who want to get additional training or make sure they're doing this well, making sure they're doing right by the client? Mm -hmm. um, I, so yeah, I like, I think, I think trauma, trauma focused, trauma informed approach mm -hmm. for sure. Okay. Um, acceptance and commitment therapy. I think that is a, for me, um, my experience in working with people and just research around um, its effectiveness with ADHD, going with the values, being mindful, having awareness of yourself, understanding what makes you anxious, how you work, all that stuff. Um, and understanding executive functions and you don't have to be doing work necessarily with somebody who has ADHD. You don't have to necessarily be addressing ADHD mm. for that diagnosis to be impacted by therapy. So many of our therapeutic approaches, when we're not, when someone has ADHD and we're focusing on their anxiety or their trauma, we also have to keep in mind what are their deficits? Where is this? Are they able to process the information that we're taking in right now? Where are they struggling? Why are they struggling? It's not, it's not just because they don't want to do these things. It's not because they don't want to do the coping skills outside of right. practice, you know, or outside of uh, the, the session. It's, you know, sometimes it's, it is literally a challenge for them to do that. 
for a many reasons. And so keeping that in mind while you're doing therapy with someone, checking in with them about those things um, is really important because otherwise what we can fall into is just those old stories they experienced in school. Like, well, you're not doing it. Well, I'm disappointed in you. Or, mm. you know, like, why isn't this working? Well, let's try harder. Or just do it. Like, <laughs> so um, keeping, keeping that in mind and also just those negative beliefs that just really bubble up underneath everything. Um, I'm not enough. I'm too, too much. Um, right. That you've given me this powerful imagery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause I think there's um, a difference between someone who you can see is checked out or they kind of do that zone out face that we're used to seeing at certain points yeah. when we're trying to drive something home and it's like, Nope, they lost you. <laughs> and that's very different than what you're saying of like modeling hey, how does this like land? Did you get this? Does this make sense? Okay, you didn't do your homework. Talk to me about that. But coming from mm -hmm. a curious place versus a critical place, yes? Yes, yes. Um, and teaching them how to slow down, the importance of slowing down. And that also goes for the therapist as well, because I think when people with ADHD come to therapy, they want to, they are, they are done struggling. You know, they want the tips. They want you to tell you how to do it tell me what apps I need to download, <laughs> how I need to motivate. Motivation is, well, I need to feel motivated. Well, part of that is just the radical acceptance that you will not feel motivated. I will never feel motivated to fold my laundry ever. Can't blame you. <laughs> yeah. And I have to accept that trying to make myself motivate, that's trying to change the way my brain works. And I'm not going to do that. And mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with the way my brain works. There's nothing wrong with me not feeling motivated to do that. I also don't, feel motivated to do a lot of things, but, you know, looking at the root of that, what is the fear? What's getting behind that? Um, I have no fear with folding laundry. I just don't want to do it, but right. There's no enjoyment for most of us. So that feels right. like it's relatable, no matter who we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Um, but slowing. Yeah. So also that energy, that anxious energy comes into the room and as a therapist, then we can oftentimes get stuck in that. Well, okay, yeah, we need to make these changes fast. Yes, and then we start to feel bad because we're not we're not helping them to make these changes. We don't have the examples for all the all the different apps. People with ADHD are the best researchers in the world. They tell me about all the new latest apps every. I mean, I'll get three new apps. I can't remember them all, but I'm like, okay, and which ones which ones were helpful for you? Which one? What did you like about them? What did you not like? What are your thoughts about it? Is this avoidance? <laughs> is your search for the perfect app, is that part of avoidance for you? So, which I think a lot of it is, and also people resonate and they, they want to, they want to feel, and they want to feel better and they want to, they want to function better. And, um, we can get caught up in trying to, in the game of, yeah, let's make your brain, not the ADHD brain. And that's not possible. And so they, we have to help them to come to acceptance and understanding that their brain is not, is an ADHD brain and, and it's unique to them, even within that label. And that the more you try to fix it or change it, the harder, the harder this, this, it will be a battle. I mean, it will just continue to be a battle. And so, and it takes away from your opportunity to learn how you function best and what's going to be best for you and, and what resources you need and what supports you need. And um, so Part of that is us slowing down as the therapist, our anxiety, helping them to slow down and really just emphasize that, that it's, it's not a quick fix. It's not a fix. It's, a, it's figuring out how you're going to work. And mm -hmm. as a therapist, not, not um, checking in with yourself about how frustrated you might get with, well, wow, we're, we've been going over the same thing every week and you're still not doing it. Like, Check right. in with yourself, you know, like that's, it, that is the true battle with ADHD is that you, you try something and it doesn't work and you try it again and it doesn't work. And then you got to try something else. And it's just, it's, it can be, it can be really devastating, but it can also be with, with thoughtful therapy. I think it can be, I know it can be, um, it, they can learn to embrace their strengths. Mm -hmm. People can learn to embrace what what they have to offer to the world right. and themselves. I love that because I feel like that's the gentle reminder to just be open, open to the fact that it's going to look different for each person, for the therapist who watched this video afterwards to say, okay, there's no one prescribed way to do this. 
don't put people in the boxes, be, be adaptable also, you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're modeling that for our clients. We're also asking them to explore that and what goes on for them and what works for them. So I think that's a really important final message here as we're talking to be like, remember this, there is no one prescribed book or one medication or one thing, like each person's unique. That's what mm -hmm. I'm hearing. Yeah. Awesome. Well, this has been so helpful. I feel like it's definitely got the juices flowing for me on how I want to approach my clients even more mindfully going forward. Are there any final thoughts or tips that you have for our clinicians who might be watching? Oh man, that's a pressure. <laughs> I was like, just what? <laughs> one thing? <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, look through those same resources that I listed for clients are really good resources for, for clinicians as well. And, you know, trusting, trusting your own intuition and your gut with this, um, and your abilities to work with people and recognizing like what's coming up for you because things will come up for you mm -hmm. and sitting with that and getting consultation and, um, asking lots of questions. Exactly. I was going to say the same thing. Get consultation. That's how we came to this conversation. <laughs> yeah. Is yeah. that I came to you and I said, Hey, <laughs> this is hey. what's coming up. Yeah. Um, so I will definitely for our viewers, put your information in this video so they can reach out if they have questions or want more information on the resources you've listed. Um, because I know that you are a valuable resource to our community. Not that you're the only one Don't want to add to your stress plate, but <laughs> I know people might just be like me going, Oh, I want more. Um, yeah. and I know that you'll have some valid recommendations for them that way. Yes. So I just want to tell you how much I appreciate this conversation, Julie. Thank you so much for making time. And I can't wait to put this out there and help our community. Thank you, Kara. Yeah. So viewers, stay tuned for more videos. We'll see you next time.